As we're making our way back to our seats, uh, we want to, first of all, extend a hearty welcome to all of those who are visiting with us. Uh, we appreciate so very, very much your presence here today, and we want you to feel at home uh, and welcomed here at the Lion Street Church of Christ. We want to also say congratulations to those who uh, cross the sands. <laughs> yeah, those who, who graduated. Uh, we want to give a shout out to you personally uh, and to encourage you uh, in life's journey. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Proverbs. Now, the message, the, the, the text that was read in your hearing was uh, Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through and including verse number 19. Keep that passage in your mind um, in as much as we're not going to have a uh, expository message today. Uh, it's going to be more topical in nature. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's virtually impossible to, um, to do an exposition of Proverbs in as much as it is a compilation of different sayings and, 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 and words of wisdom that are sometimes, you know, there's no cohesion. Uh, now, if you look at this book, uh, we see that the book of Proverbs emphasizes some basic truths about the nature of man. Now, we know it is, it's called wisdom literature. We refer to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and even Psalms as wisdom literature. It was wise uh, sayings that were passed down uh, to young men that they may take on wisdom and therefore lead a life that is productive and fulfilling. And so when we look at this book in, in, in light of our theme for this month, which is uh, being honest with God, being honest with yourself, and being honest with others. And on last time that we, 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 we touched on this theme, we talked about we have to be honest with God. You got to come clean if you want to get clean. In other words, we need to line up with God's assessment of, 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 of your life. For the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what we have to do is confess that. Confession, confess comes from the word homo lugeo, which simply means to say or to speak the same. You see, when, when Jesus was baptized by John, as he came up uh, out of the water, the Bible says that a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And so uh, the Gospel of John sets out uh, in its narrative to produce enough evidence that causes you to, to make a determination that the Bible is true in its assessment about Jesus. The Bible says uh, that many things in this book that were written in this book, many miracles Jesus did that are not written in this book. Get it right, Brother Merriweather. He said, but these things have been written that you may, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and through believing have life in his name. And so even for our salvation, we must agree with God. When we make the grand confession, we say the same thing God said. We said, yes, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But you see, even as you go through life, your sanctification um, is contingent upon and dependent upon you agreeing with God. For the Bible says in 1 John, if we say that we have no sin, it says we, we, we are lying, the truth is not in us. If we confess our faults, if we come clean to one another, if we come clean before God, then the Bible says, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So confession is important. And so the first, uh, the first 
rung of the ladder, the first step we had to take was to confess or to agree with God in his assessment of us. Now today, as we take the next step up the ladder, we now have to understand the importance of being true to you. So I want to take for a title today, To Thyself Be True. And we're going to look at some characteristics of man. These characteristics uh, help us to see us more clearly. And when you see yourself more clearly, you're able to now understand uh, more vividly and see more clearly your, your purpose in life, your responsibility to God and to those around you. See, sometimes we live in a very pretentious world. We live in a world that is so, it is so fake. There's a city I used to live in, they called it Tinseltown. <laughs> Tinseltown. In other words, everything was a facade. Everybody fronting. Everybody putting on airs. Everybody trying to be somebody they're not. And we do it too. You know, we, we, the, the kind of, we, we buy clothes and we buy cars and all that kind of, to impress other folk. Folk ain't thinking about you. Problem is, you, you, you dress, uh, you even go to certain outings and certain functions. And on the card it says, dress to impress. <laughs> dress to impress. And we're always trying to put our best foot forward. Nothing wrong with a, a, a good presentation of self. But you see, God is the one who looks at the heart. He looks at the motives. And, you know, <laughs> leave that alone. Leave that alone, Brother Merriweather. Go ahead and preach your message. And don't get in trouble. Somebody say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and so, I hear you, Doc. And so as we look at this book, this wisdom literature helps us to uh, understand God's wisdom. And if we would read, and more importantly, if we would heed the very principles that God wants to give us, uh, we will be wise and fruitful. We'll be like a tree planted by water, and we will flourish and grow. We won't wither, even in the scorching sun. The Apostle Paul once said, he said, I am made all things to all men. Remember that? That I might by all means save some. What he's really saying there is, you know, you can't judge a man unless you walk a mile in his moccasins, right? If you want to communicate in such a way that you will have lasting impact in the lives of others, you have to be able to see, you have to sit on their side of the table. In other words, you have to be able to, to empathize with what they're going through. You have to at least have some kind of familiarity uh, with who they are and, and what's going on, what makes them tick. And the Apostle Paul says, I, to the Jew, I became as a Jew. To the weak, I became as weak. To the poor, I became as a poor. Right. In other words, he, he's able to empathize with them. He's able to, 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 to feel what they feel and, and to hurt when they hurt. And he walked a mile in their shoes. In order that he could relate to them. In order that he may be able to now, as he has built a rapport, Share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so today, my purpose is uh, that we would uh, become aware of the basic character and characteristics of man. If we are to move uh, comprehensively uh, to address the needs of others. That's the point. That's the point. But it's, it starts with self. Yes, we need to understand what's going on in somebody else's mind you know, do some kind of feasibility study and so do different demographics and find out what makes Evansville Evan tick. Who is Evansville Ed, Evan? You know, what, is his, what are his likes and dislikes? You know, what does he uh, gravitate to? What is his proclivities? You know, what, what kind of things turn him on? But before we're able to effectively do that, what about you? What about us? What makes us who we are? What is our identifying characteristics? 
and how pleased is God with what he sees in you and I. See, you've got to be true to yourself. After you have uh, come clean before God, your responsibility is to recognize areas in your life that have to be yielded to God. See, each and every one of us, I don't care who you are, where you're from, all of us have different idiosyncrasies. We've got little quirks. We got little likes and dislikes. There are certain buttons that somebody can, I may not be able to press your button today, but there's somebody who can press your button. Yeah, who will make you something. This woman, this man, this man said to his wife, and she was nagging. He said, You bring out the worst in me. The only way I can bring out the worst in you is because the worst was in you. Sometimes God, sometimes God will put somebody in your life. To bring out the worst in you. That stuff you've been hiding. That stuff you have swept under the rug. That nobody knows. You, you got that on lockdown. And if somebody comes in your, in your life and says something or rubs you the wrong way and all that stuff starts flying out. Skeletons in your closet. Remember I talked about the junk drawer? Don't make me open up my junk drawer today. All kind of stuff fly out of there. Stuff you forgot about. Yeah. But when you're being honest with yourself and when you're continuously taking a self-inventory through the, in, the lens of the Holy Spirit, God will reveal to you areas in your life that have not been yielded to Jesus. And when you find those areas in your life that are still running wild, have not been under the yoke of, of Christ, then it becomes your responsibility to cast all of your cares, all of your anxieties, all of your hurts, all of your inadequacies to the Lord. And he said, here, here, take care of you. See, the problem is we have not uh, been true to ourselves. Amen. And, and we, since we have not been true to ourselves, we still have this veneer of everything is all right. Amen. I'm okay and you okay. Amen. I'm not saying that we need to be just no emotional an emotional uh, wimp that we all over the place. But, you know, we have to be transparent with God. And when you are transparent with God, it helps you to look at, in the mirror and see your proper reflection. And I'm not talking about what kind of lipstick you got on today. I'm not talking about what, you know, you know, Brothers, did you guys, you miss a spot with your little Grecian formula and all that kind of stuff? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what lies beneath the surface. See, God looks at the heart, the inside. And we will do well to see what God sees. And then have the courage and the love for God to say, I'm now agreeing with you. I am now confessing to you. These are areas that have been too big for me to handle. And give it to the Lord. And he's promised, I'll take care of you. Now, you've got to believe that God is able to take care of you today. Oh, yes, you do. And so as we recognize those areas in our lives that need to be yielded to him, um, as we look at the natural characteristics of man, uh, I, I want to say that the, the Psalms are, they serve as a safeguard against man's most basic problems. Man's most basic problems. And I'm going to suggest today that man's most basic problem is, I was going to say sin, but it ain't it. Man's most basic problem is pride. It was pride that led to sin. When, when, when. When, when, when Eve looked at that fruit, and the Satan and the devil, the Satan, uh, the, the, the adversary, he said, this, is, this will make you wise like God. That appealed to pride. And, and, and therefore, I disregard God's instruction. Because pride has stepped in, and pride has suggested that I will be elevated I'll be vaunted, elevated to the position of God. 
and that led to the transgression. And so we are prideful folk. Now, let's not get it twisted. You know, I, 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 there is something to say that's very redeeming about pride. Man should be proud of his achievements. You know, when my kids, you know, come home with a good, you know, mark on their homework or test or whatever, yes, we stick it on the refrigerator. All the magnets, we stick stuff on the refrigerator. We want them to know that we are proud of them. We want them to have good, positive uh, self-esteem and all that kind of stuff. But you see, I'm talking about when pride causes you uh, to begin to compromise God's word to fit your own standard. You see, uh, man is not willing to admit uh, that he is not in control of the universe. His pride won't allow him to admit that he's not large and in charge. And, and so since he, he has a, a problem with that, that he's not in control of the universe, he's not in control of the earth, he's not even con in control of many of his own actions. And therefore, he's not in control of his destiny. God is the one who's in control. But the conflict comes when we try to impose upon God and we want to be our own God. So let me give you three things today that I hope and pray uh, will, will help us uh, in understanding uh, the danger of pride and then also how to combat the sinful tendencies that emerge from a prideful heart. Now, let's, I, like I said, there's going to be a topical message today, so I'm going to be using various passages, and then we're going to revert back to and refer back to uh, the passage that was read in your hearing at the end. But I just want to read that again for emphasis sake. It says, these six things uh, does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. And, and, and later on in the year, I think, I'm going to do a message that's going to identify each of these things. And we're going to do some kind of treatment of each of these. But suffice for today is to mention them so we can begin in this lesson today. Uh, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked imaginations, feet uh, that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Does anybody fit that description? You can come on down front now. Or are we going to continue to pretend that we're okay? See, I, my name is Gino Merriweather, and I want to let you know right now that when I read this list, I find myself wanting. There is in my life uh, the, that don't measure up. Sometimes I find myself uh, fitting one of these descriptions. And just as uh, the prophet Isaiah said when he came in a clear view of the glory, splendor, and majesty of God, he said, Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. But get this, and he says, And I dwell among a people that are just like me. Okay? So we all have to admit that there are areas in our lives, certain areas that no one may see, but those areas are areas that have not been yielded to God, and we find ourselves uh, uh, in, in, in embellishing and embracing certain characteristics uh, that are an abomination to God. The first thing I want to say is humility before God produces honesty with self. Humility before God produces honesty with self. If we are honest with ourselves, if is a big word, right? Can we be honest today? Y'all going to leave me hanging? My hand is getting tired like I got a big old, big old mitt on. If, if, if. Uh, we 
Or to be honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that our biggest difficulty in being honest with ourselves is the fact that we are not honest with ourselves. <laughs> well, Brother Mary, what do you mean by that? Well, number one, men typically pretend to be something they are not. Men typically, and, and, and when I say men, uh, before all the women start saying amen and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> I'm talking about mankind, okay? I'm talking about uh, anthropos, from which we get the word anthropology, right? Which is the study of man. I'm talking about mankind. So I'm talking about everybody in here, self included. And, and so men typically pretend to be something they are not. Did that ring clear to you? Most men will proclaim, the Bible says, most men will proclaim his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Just like 31, uh, uh, Proverbs 31, talking about the virtual woman. You know, who can find? And everybody, if I said, well, all the virtuous women in the house, stand up. How many are going to remain seated? <laughs> but then we begin to look at God's criteria of a virtuous woman. How many would have to take their seat? None. Why? Because pride won't let you sit down. Pride won't let you confess that we are not all there. Pride won't let you agree with God. Even when you get caught in a lie, we begin to fabricate another lie to try to cover up the other lie and validate and justify what we do. We call it situation ethics because when we begin to bend and contort truth to fit, you know, what we've done. Most men uh, typically pretend to be something they are not. Each man thinks he is right, even when he knows he's wrong. Ouch. Each man thinks he's right, even when he knows he's wrong. Even if, he, uh, if we have a knockdown, drag out a debate, and you convince me uh, that I'm wrong. I may capitulate, I may give in, but then uh, in a certain situation, I may revert back to what I always believed. They said a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And so therefore, when the rubber meets the road and it gets hot, we find ourselves drifting back to the thing that we had embraced. Now... The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, it says there is a way. There is a way that seems right to a man. <laughs> yeah, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Notice there is a way, singular, that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways, ways, plural, of death. Every man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the heart. Another problem with man, all of this is related to pride, man desires, uh, he desires independence from God. That was the problem in the garden. You'll be like God. You'll be on the same even par with God. So therefore, you know, and we even, we teach our kids to be independent, right? There is something good to be said about self-sufficiency. We want to tell all of our young men, you know, to be self-sufficient, to be able to be industrious, you know, to be able to work and to be able to earn income and, and therefore you, and all, all the ladies out there, let me just tell you, I didn't send you my message. When you are, uh, Considering, you know, a mate, when that one guy is wooing you, and every time he smiles, his teeth just sparkle, like he been eating that, what's that chewing gum? 
<laughs> Even in chewing, his teeth just start sparkling. And every time he said something, he said, oh, just like honey from a honeycomb. And he got his little conversation down, his rap, and he's saying some stuff. That, oh, just, he said, come on over here. He said, you don't even walk. You just float over there. <laughs> Brother ain't got no job. <laughs> ain't got no car. Somebody said, I don't want no scrub. <laughs> Living in his mama's house. <clears throat> you better. <clears throat> and you get on out there on your own. And you, you know, it's time. You know, that season in life begins to come. The, the birds are, are seeing, the butterflies are flying around, and, and you're looking around. And take a hint from wisdom literature. Understand. When folk are putting their best foot forward, you better look behind and see where their other foot is. Are you hearing me? And yeah, they got the best foot forward. And the other feet, shoes all run over on the other foot. <laughs> Men desire independence, but in actuality and in reality, we are all dependent on the grace of God. Without the grace of God, where would we be? Uh, in terms of salvation, where would you be? In terms of your ability just to matriculate through society, where would you be without the grace of God? Yes, you can be independent if you want to. Who can say, I have made my heart clean? Uh, I am pure from my sin. Who can say that? Only God can forgive sin. That was the problem we had in our last study when we talked about the antinomians. Remember that? Those who were against law, who said they were above the law. And because they had you know, reached higher you know, div divine insight, that they could just go ahead. They, they didn't have any sin. They were righteous based on personal performance. No, 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 no. We all need God. And, and so that's why the prophet Isaiah, he had to acknowledge uh, uh, the beauty, uh, the splendor, and the majesty of God, when he, in that great vision of Isaiah chapter 6, when he saw uh, the brilliance of God, he down realized that it wasn't about Uzziah sitting on the throne. It was about the God of the universe was really the one who was sitting on the throne. And when he beheld the, the, the righteous of God, he says, I'm undone. You see, before, before he may have had certain kind of... Um, notions of his own self-sufficiency. But when he began to see God more clearly, he was able to see himself more clearly, and he realized he was nothing. And it was then, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord took the thong and took a coal uh, from the altar and touched him on, on his lips, on his mouth, and said, now you're clean. It wasn't until after he agreed with God that he was sinful. It wasn't until after he saw that God was uh, divine and righteous and that he, before he saw himself. And after that, see, God is waiting on you to come clean before him. He's waiting on you to confess that you don't know it all. You don't have it all. You're not the all in all. But when you get to that point, then God says, now my grace is sufficient for you. Because now that you have admitted your weakness, my strength, is magnified in your weakness. When you begin to do things that it's impossible for you to do by yourself, and God gives you the victory, now you can talk about glorifying God. Now you can talk about having a testimony. Sometimes the only thing we can do is tell people, uh, don't do this and don't do that, uh, because that's what kept me down. I want us to be able to tell somebody, don't do this and don't do that, because... My life is what it is now because the word of God gave me insight and I was able to avoid certain things. You know, how many times do you have to touch the stove uh, until you come to the realization that fire is hot? Sometimes you can learn from hard knocks that you see on somebody else's head. There don't got to be knocks on your own head. Look at folk around you who, who, who squander their lives. And then find someone who's doing well and begin to observe them. That's what mentoring is all about, by the way. 
See, once I had the pleasure, once I had the pleasure of, uh, uh, to meet a man uh, whom I developed a friendship with. <clears throat> now I can sit, I, can, I know his name right there, I'm not going to tell it. It was in Cerritos, California. And, you know, we became, you know, good friends. And we was, you know, doing some business stuff together and all that kind of stuff, right? And we shared a lot of things in common. But you see, there were certain things that were sharp difference. Yeah, yeah. And as we had discussions about those things that we had in common, invariably we would also begin to move along the line of the things that we had differences on. Now, in my pride and in his pride, in my naivete and his naivete, you know what we thought? I'll tell you what I thought. I thought if I could just give him the right information, if I could provide him with the correct information, that would put him on the right track. See, I thought, you know, even bringing people to the Lord, sometimes we think it's just providing information. And we, we, we see, here's the problem. See, I knew I was right. And guess what? He knew he was right. And so, in, in, instead of us really being able to lay out our position statements and evidences for what we believe and all that kind of stuff, we've never even got to that point. We never begin to really deal with, you know, uh, the origins of where he got his uh, hypothesis and all that kind of stuff. And we, we stopped in the beginning. And we just went head up, you know, clashing based on the basic stuff, never even looking at how we arrived at where we arrived at. See, everybody has a, uh, 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 you, pos- you oppo- suppose certain things to be true, right? Everybody has a supposition. But that supposition comes from a presupposition. See, everything that you know right now, you have been taught before. And so, for, therefore, if you come and you converge on Scripture, you're going to look at that Scripture through the lens of your presuppositions. Everything that you already know and everything you've already heard is going to be reinforced by how you see, how you read this thing. So therefore, when we read the Bible, we have to be honest. One of the most difficult things that, to do is to study the Bible. Because to really accurately study the Bible, you have to be honest. Because there may be some things that you have heard uh, through, throughout, throughout your life. You've come to embrace as truth. I told you about that time. I, 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 uh, uh, I think I was in the first grade. Miss Brown was my teacher. And we had to get up and talk about, you know, what we got for Christmas. And I got up, started talking about what Santa Claus brought me. And then the guy on the recess, I forget who it was, he said, there was no such thing as Santa Claus. And now we get ready to fight it on, on, out on the playground <laughs> over Santa Claus. See, on the surface, that's, that's all it was. But it was deeper than that. See, every time you talk to somebody and, and, and you guys aren't vibing, we, we stay on the surface. All the, no, so there's something deeper than that. Because I remember distinctly when we tried to, we, we lived in, we had upstairs, we were trying to look down and see what what's on, they put under the tree and all that kind of stuff. And my mother said, boy, get on back upstairs or Santa Claus ain't going to come. And I the guy went up, finally went to sleep and woke up the next day and saw empirical evidence undeniable evidence that there is a Santa Claus. All in presence all over the place. And so when that boy said there's no Santa Claus, he was calling my mama a lie. And I wasn't having it. So we have to look past the surface. There's some underlining presuppositions there that folk have been embracing all their lives and and you can't just rock their world and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we, we fell out, and we had hot contentions because we did not respect the fact that perhaps, perhaps, just maybe, if I wasn't trying to just prove my point that I'm right because of my pride said I got to stand my ground, I won that battle, lost the war, lost the war, 
But I gave him a piece of my mind. And we chalked that up as a victory. That's a defeat. Because Paul said, I become all things to all men. That by all means I may say some. The second thing I want to share with you today as we deal with this problem of pride. Human control must give way to God's control. Now, you hear, you hear me out there? See, we, we, we want to be in control, right? In many respects, you know, we are control freaks. We're control freaks. That's why relationships, you know, uh, don't work out because one person wants to dominate and control the other. And, and so, wanting to impose our will on others for our own personal gain. James would, James chapter 4, James would attribute this to many of the problems in, in the world from which comes wars and, and quarreling and all that kind of stuff. It's because we have an insatiable desire to be in control. We have an insatiable desire to have power, to manipulate and control other people, to get what we want at all costs. See, man, here's the, here's, the, here's the appeal on this thing, though. Man's failure, uh, excuse me, man's future is not in his own hands. Right. If I said everybody go outside, and I want you to go out there and hold it in your hand, and I want you to catch the wind and bring it back in here. That stuff's not in your control. It's not in your own control. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Those are songs, what a difference a day makes. 24 hours. From 24 hours, from this 24 hours to the next 24 hours, you don't have a clue what's going to happen. We don't have control over that. And it really blows our mind because we, we, we plan and, and, and we do all this. And nothing wrong with planning. I think it's, 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 it's very frugal. You know, to plan and all that kind of stuff. But you have to understand that uh, yo, 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 your number can be punched any moment. You're not in control. See, man's insatiable desire to know and to possess more and more and more will never be satisfied. The more you get, the more you want. The, the Bible talks about a, a situation. This was a, there was a man. This man, it doesn't say that he was a good man or a bad man. Didn't say that. There was a man who um, was doing pretty good. God was blessing him. And, and, and he had, you know, his storehouses filled to the brim. And then he had, God blessed him with a bumper crop. And he began to realize that he did not have enough room to store, underline the word store. He didn't have enough room to, to store, we call it hoarding. He didn't, he didn't have enough room to store you know, hoarding, you know, to store all this stuff. So you know what he said? What did he say? I'm going to go over here and buy me a storage lot now. <laughs> I'm going to tear these barns down. They're, in, they're insufficient now. I'm going to build bigger barns, bigger barns, so I can store more stuff. While all these poor folk walking around, all people in need walking around. And he, you know, that passage talked about uh, the person who uh, has the proud look. That is a person who, who, who look is so, he, his gaze is so lofty that he can't see folk right, right there with him who are in need, who are hurting, who are distressed, who are downtrodden. No, all you can see is you know, what you are going to do and what, what you want and how it's going to make you look in the eyes of the masses. God said, thou fool. He called him a fool. Why did he call him a fool? He must have been, you know, pretty industrious to have this crop. He, he must have been a smart person to, to, to know how to engage in agriculture or whatever he was engaging in. But he missed it. See, he thought it was all his. Do you not know everything that you possess? Everything that you possess belongs to the Lord. Hello? The beautiful thing is he has entrusted you 
with proper stewardship. Okay, the word stewardship means household management, right? It means that you have been placed in charge to manage the affairs of another. That's all stewardship is. Your life is not your life. But why God has given you this life, you have to properly manage it. Yeah, I went to my doctor's office, right? And you know what? He may have thought I was, you know, because I told him, you know, I said, you know, my health is my responsibility. So I am hiring you as a consultant. He know how to handle that. Because people don't talk to doctors like that, you know. <laughs> I said, well, I'm hiring you as my consultant. I read it somewhere. <laughs> it sounded good to me. <laughs> but the point is, you know, your life, you know, has to be properly managed. And God owns your life. He owns all you have. Now it's up to you to exercise faithful and proper stewardship over what God has entrusted to you. Amen. That's what this is about. But you see, we get it twisted because we think this is all mine. Because we want more. We're never satisfied. The more I get, the more I want. I want to uh, get all I can and can all I get. Man rejoices. And here's the, here's the reality, though. We are all individuals, right? You're an individual, right? We're all members of the body. We're all family. But we're all individuals, right? And so there are certain things that we can do in community. We're here today to worship in community. But the vibrancy of this community or this communal worship has a lot to do with your private worship. If there's no private, if there's no quality to your private worship, then the corporate worship will not be what God intends it to be. Does that make sense? And, and so uh, we understand that there are certain things that we have to do all by ourselves. You must rejoice. Yes, we rejoice with others. And yes, when we, when we lose a loved one, we mourn with others, right? But when you lose a loved one, and everyone comes and they support you and all that, that's great. But no one can mourn for you. No one can rejoice for you. They may rejoice with you, but they can't rejoice. Because no one knows really what's going on. If you won the big championship, and everybody's all hoorah, hoorah, but your joy is your own. And your joy would be uh, based upon all that you put into realizing that victory. Your, your, your mourning or your sadness. You know, you're, yes, child, I don't, it's only going to be all right. And, and I know how you feel. Well, do you really? Everybody's different. Everybody has to go through those processes uh, in their way. So best believe that you have to walk certain roads alone. There are some things that are just too private and too personal to share with somebody else. The only one you can take it to is to the Lord. Isn't it good to know that you can take your burdens to the Lord? Your hurts and your deep, deep sentiments, your deep feelings that no one can understand, God understands. And he wants you to bring it to him. That's where you find your healing. That's where you find your strength. See, the proud, they resist God. And consequently, the Bible says God resists the proud. They resist God in their understanding. They resist God in terms of uh, the truth of his word. Because if you want to do what you want to do, you're going to disregard the truth of God's word. A lot of people are, 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 are atheists because of rebellion. I just didn't become an atheist because I just didn't believe looking at this the constellation, all the, I just believe, I didn't believe, it. I didn't just embrace the fact that there is no God. It was because if there is a God, then I can't think and, and live and do what I want to do. So I dismiss God. We call it humanism, by the way. We, dimi- we dismiss God. So man is in control of his own universe. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about adhering to a, a divine standard. I'll make my own standard. 
So the proud resist God. They resist um, their understanding of God. Uh, in, their, in the way in which they make laws, in the way that they pursue living, they resist God. Therefore, it's no wonder why the Bible says God will resist them. Let's not be too proud that God resists us. Finally, let me just give you a positive note on this. I think this is the glorious part of this thing. And see, see, we understand that uh, humility before God uh, produces honesty with ourselves. We have to look at the fact that we have not been honest. We also understand that man is not in control. But then finally, we have to be blessed with this notion of encouragement. Harmony with God produces peace with yourself. See, sometimes we are at war with ourselves. Sometimes we just don't like ourselves. When you find all the failures you've had, all the uh, missed opportunities you had, all the stuff you squandered, all the stuff you got wrong, all the mess you made, we can begin to not really like ourselves. We call that low self-esteem. You know, we begin to have a negative view of ourselves. We call it pessimism. Very pessimistic. We have a, 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 a low assessment and value of ourselves. And therefore, everything around us is going to always go wrong. Don't even go look for a job because I know they're not going to hire me. And so we begin to shoot ourselves in the foot. You see, the Word of God provides a road map for safe travel through life. You know that? If you really understand the Word of God for what it is, go back and read the Proverbs. It becomes a road map. It helps you to travel and navigate through turbulent times. It will get you safely on the other side. The Word of God provides that road map as you travel through life. The Word of God provides counsel to give you wisdom to make good decisions. Amen. Good decisions. Amen. See, people can be very, very, you know, have a high, you know, with an IQ and all that kind of stuff and still make stupid mistakes and still do stuff to just to flat out. Where did they get that from? But the Word of God, you know, you don't have to have a Ph.D. in anything, but if you apply the Word of God, nothing wrong with a Ph.D., but if you apply the Word of God to your living in a practical way, do you not know that will give you wise counsel? It'll help you make decisions that are prudent. It'll help you avoid pitfalls uh, of life. It'll give you peace and comfort, even in times of distress. Yeah, that's why the believer is, even though we're cast down, we're not destroyed. We'll be in, but we won't break because we understand the Word of God and we try to use the Word of God as a light that will illuminate our path. Amen. Good news. Good news, the Bible says, makes a person happy. As cold water uh, to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Good news from a far country. What are, have you heard the good news lately? Have you heard any good news? Y'all want to hear some good news? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know what I mean? As you. So for God so, whatever your name is, for God so loved Gino Merriweather. And you fill in your blank. He so loved Gino Merriweather that he gave his only begotten son for me. Are you feeling me? He gave his only begotten son. So therefore, when I believe in him, when I put my trust in him, when I stand putting the full weight of my life on him, I would not be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. See, anxiety and, and, and worry, um, that does nothing but tear down a man. If you're always worrying, that would tear you, it would sap your energy. See, see, what's the difference between meditation and, and worry? Meditation is, is, medit is, is focused thinking on that which is good, that which is productive, that which is in harmony with God, while worry is negative focus, negative thinking. Just think, you know, just flip the script. Keep on, keep on, you know, having an intense focus. But what are you focusing on is the key. And other than that, let me give you this. And I, I, I like this because this helps us all to be there for one another. The Bible says 
a good, a faithful and godly friend improves a man's character. So if you want to have better character and you're struggling with some things, won't you settle up with somebody who you see to be going somewhere, to be doing some things, to be exhibiting certain character? Well, Brother Mary, I can't find nobody like that. Looking right at me. I don't find nobody like that. <laughs> I don't think you that either. Don't look at me, look at Jesus there. See, Jesus is your model. And even in this church, there are people who are in this church. I'm looking at godly women and godly men who can be a model. They can be a mentor for you. For the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron. And see, you can't, you can't sharpen, you know, somebody else unless there is some kind of contact. So God is challenging us to, to, to begin to uh, seek out those who uh, you can see God's activity in their life. That is going to bless you. Again, again, we've said this earlier. We said it earlier. Uh, these six things God hates, and seven are abomination unto him. And they are a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that divide wicked imaginations, feet that are swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows seeds among brethren. Now, let me just leave this with you. It is easy, and I'm sure if we're being honest today, we are being honest, right? We're being honest today, right? This is the honesty day, right? It's easy to identify and to even hate these character traits in the lives of others. Isn't that right? You see somebody who's a liar. You see someone always stirring up trouble. It's easy to identify those folks and even hate those character traits in them, right? Right? But the challenge is for us to be able to identify and even to hate the abominations uh, that lie within us. Now, when you see it in somebody else, you go, I hate that. I hope they get what they deserve. But when you find that same thing in you, do you say, I, that, I hope I get what I deserve? See, we've been honest with ourselves, aren't we? Aren't we? Huh? Huh? Talk to me. Can you, when you see sin in your life, can you identify and come clean with that to God? And then take that to the Lord and leave it there. Can you do that? See, that's the, that, is, that is what we are. Now watch this. Even as it relates to you coming into a right relationship. See, honesty before God helps you to admit that, Lord, I have not been everything that I have pretended to be. As a matter of fact, I have lived a life as though I did not need you. But now I'm coming clean and said, Lord, I need you. I need you right now. And now the way I've been living has suggested that I had no need for you in my life. Well, you know what? I'm scrapping all that. I'm going to turn from uh, the way of the world. Now I'm turning to you, Lord. I'm turning to you, God. And God can, if, if you can hear me, I know you can, but in my own human pride and arrogance, I know that someone came to me based on where I am right now. I would not hear them. So I don't expect you to hear me because I know me. And I wouldn't hear somebody else in need. See, sometimes we view God based on our view of ourselves. You've been a low-down, dirty scoundrel all your life. You can't see a guy who's going to be forgiving towards you. But God is saying, I'm bigger than you. See, my ways are not your ways. See, my ways are way above yours, and my thoughts are way above your thoughts. And so, scrap your agenda. Understand you're not large and in charge. I, I run it here. I run the universe. Where were you when I stretched out the heavens? Where were you when I made the constellations? Where were you when I was putting all this together? You're not worthy to put on my shoes. If I was sick, uh, I wouldn't tell you about it. God said, God said if I needed a loan, <laughs> I wouldn't come to you. 
Let's not get let's not beside ourselves. See that, <coughs> see that pride won't even let me come to God for health. It won't let me come God, to God for healing, for salvation. I begin to try to do it on my own. You know, we use this passage over in Romans chapter 10, right? And we talk about what the Bible is talking about in Romans chapter 10, but we never read Romans chapter 10. We go to our little verse. But notice what Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 says. The Apostle Paul says, my prayer and desire uh, for Israel is that they may be saved. He said, but I bear them record. They have a, a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And they therefore being ignorant of the righteousness of God had gone to establish their own righteousness. So the whole context of Romans chapter 10 is coming out of a context of the Apostle Paul talking about the ignorance of men who are concocting their own form of godliness. But it's hard, though. It's hard. It's hard to read verse 1. It's hard to start at the beginning of that. Because it begins to rock our world. It, 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 it makes our theological framework a house of cards. And I don't know about you, but my pride, my, my failure, my inability to say, God, you're right and I'm wrong gets the best of us. And then for we had to, I, I, I had to work that thing. I got I to gotta come up with a different interpretation. God loves you. So God has provided everything that you need to be fed by the bread of life. But pride says, I ain't hungry. God has provided the water, the living water of the Holy Spirit. Uh, to give you to quench your thirst. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you would never thirst again, but I'm too proud to say I'm thirsty. The table has been set before us. The banquet table has been set. Are you humble enough to come before him? He said, I will feed you. I will quench your thirst. I give you everything you need. If you're here today, and you need to give your life to God. It starts by simply saying, yes, I've been, I've been, you know, too proud. But now I'm humbling myself. I'm repenting of my old life. I want to now forsake my old ways and saddle up to your ways.